Good morning, friends. Welcome to another beautiful day to walk out life with God. We are studying the Passion Translation, and today we're looking at Matthew 11. I'm going to give people just a little bit of time to get here, and I hope that you are encouraged today. If you're not encouraged, I hope that you will be encouraged. That's what I hope. I hope you will be encouraged. I do, I do, I do. Okie dokie. Awesome. Well, let's pray for it. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you that you are with us in time of trouble, and you're with us in time of triumph. That you're for us and not against us. God, I pray you would open up your word to us. Help us have uh, clearer eyes today, clearer vision. Help us feel strengthened on the inside where we feel weak, where some feel forlorn, where some feel defeated and deserted where some feel they're just walking on sharp rocks and they have no choice and they have no idea when the sharp rocks will end and the level road will begin God you meet each one of us where we are God I pray today you'd strengthen our intentions strengthen our insides the insides of our heart where we are in a um, great desire of you. That core place where you live on the inside of us. God, we say yes. <laughs> we say yes to more of your revelation, more to your reality, more to your presence. More to uh, understanding the goodness of God in the land where we're living. God, strengthen us today in a new way. Give us truth today in a new way, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give it one more momento. And I just tell you that you're loved and you are a one of a kind. One of a kind. That there's no one like you. That you are one of a kind. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I bless you this morning. You're welcome to share this with a friend. You can find someone that would be encouraged by the word. We're starting in chapter 11, and uh, we are reading from the Passion Translation. And the subtitles, which weren't always there, but says Jesus and John the baptizer. After Jesus, Jesus finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he went on to minister in different villages throughout the region. Well, do you know that just that little bitty paragraph is telling us, let me share with you, I love, I love this. Let me share with you what that specific little bitty paragraph is telling us. You ready? Oh. Well, I would tell you, but that's not it. How's that? <laughs> now, while John the baptizer was in prison, he heard about what Christ was doing among the people, so he sent his disciples to ask him this question. Are you really the one prophesied would come, or should we still wait for another? And Jesus answered them, Give John this report. The blind see again, the crippled walk. Lepers are cured, the deaf hear. The dead are raised back to life, and the poor and broken now hear of the hope of salvation. That specific scripture 
is telling them that it's the fulfillment of many of the Old Testament references to the coming of the Messiah. It includes Isaiah 29, 18. Let me read you 29, verse 18 and 19. And on that day, what day? The day of Christ. On that day, the deaf shall hear words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The afflicted also shall increase their gladness in the Lord. And the needy of mankind shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. That's Isaiah 29, 18 and 19. It's a fulfillment of scripture from the Old Covenant. You know, Jesus came to fulfill what was spoken of him. He speaks to us today personally and intimately, but he was speaking to them that day personally and intimately. He was telling them, hey, I'm here. You've been looking for me for a long time, and now I'm here. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. I have words for you, he was saying. I have a life for you. I have healing for you. I have love for you. It says, until John, that the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me no matter what happens. Listen, if you feel like you're walking on uh, knives, which is what came to mind today, on sharp knives, and you don't know when those sharp knives are going to end, I just want to encourage you and tell you that they will end. That keep your faith in Christ no matter what happens. No matter what happens, keep your faith. Keep your trust. Keep looking, keep expecting, keep knowing. Keep your knower in tune. Don't allow yourself to get angry. Don't allow yourself to say, well, God doesn't care. Nobody cares. This is ridiculous. Don't allow yourself to go into that place of darkness and dimness. Because in that place, you won't be able to have joy. You won't be able to find any kind of encouragement or hope. Instead, you will be stuck in the sickness. You will be stuck in the depression. You will be stuck in the despair. You will be stuck on a rainy day with no hope if you allow your heart to turn in such a way that you literally go, that's it. He doesn't give a flip, so I'm done. Stop before you allow yourself to move into that place and say, no. God is for me. No. He is kind. No. He loves me. No. He is with me. No. He lives inside me. No. He is right here. Right here. We are one. We are one. Keep your heart in the place where you know you are one. He's not going to leave you no matter what you think. No matter what you say. No matter what you do. No matter how angry you get. No matter how ticked off you are. He won't leave you. But it will be very difficult for you to find the presence of God within the condition you're in. If you have an angry, bitter heart. If you have a place where you just have so much unforgiveness and so much pain, that you're like, eh, it would be very difficult for you to connect. Just like when you're in a relationship with someone, you get angry with them. You don't want to talk to them. You want to answer them on the phone. You don't want to go see them. You turn your head from them. It's the same kind of thing. That intention, that emotion is there, and it, it caps off something when you should be drinking the whole time. Drinking in your circumstances, the life of God, to see you through the circumstances, to see you through the darkness, till you're on the other side. So he told John, he, he told them, tell John, the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, that are never offended in me. And as they were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. You know, Jesus and John, they were cousins. They were family. They were spiritual family. And they were also earthly blood family. As they were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What kind of man did you see when you went out to the wilderness? Did you expect to see a man who would be easily intimidated? Who was he? Did you expect to see a man decked out in the splendid fashion of the day? Those who wear fancy clothes live like kings in palaces. Or did you encounter a true prophet out in the lonely wilderness? Yes, John was a prophet like those of the past. But he is even more than that. He was the fulfillment of this scripture. 
See, I'm sending my prophetic messenger who will go ahead of me and prepare hearts to receive me. Jesus and John, cousins, friends. Jesus was for John. I have, I have heard teachings where people have insinuated that Jesus was chastising John because John was having a moment when he was in prison. I don't think Jesus was chastising John. I don't think he was coming down hard on John. Why would love come down hard on someone whose life was fixing the end? Because of him. That makes absolutely no logical sense and no spiritual sense whatsoever when you think about the heart of God, the heart of the Father, the heart of love. No. And Jesus went on to say, For I tell you the truth. Throughout history, there has never been a man who surpasses John the Baptizer or John the Immerser. Yet the least of those who now experience heaven's kingdom realm will become even greater than he. He was telling those disciples. He was telling those that were among the people. He was telling them, listen, John the Baptist, he was the greatest prophet of all the old prophets. He is my man. But then he said, but guess what? You, those who follow me, those of you who have me inside of you, those who have relationship with Father the way I have relationship with Father, you are going to even see greater. You're going to experience even more. You are even greater than John. This was a huge thing. From the moment he says, he goes on, from the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth. And passionate people have taken hold of its power. For all the prophets and the Torah prophesied until John appeared. Do you hear that? For all the prophets and the Torah prophesied until John appeared. So at that point in time, when John appeared, all those prophets, all those voices, all those ideas, everything that was pointing stopped prophesying. Why? Because John came. John came to talk about the light. John came to talk about the Messiah. John came to introduce the one that all these others were talking about. They could talk about him, but John had met him. They could prophesy about him. They could hear about the coming king, and they could tell about the coming king, and they could write about the coming king, but John had met. He met the coming king. He was kin to the coming king. It was personal. And he goes on to say, if you can receive this truth, John is the Elijah who is destined to come. So listen and understand what I'm telling you, Jesus said. If you have ears to hear, listen. You better listen, he told them. Listen to me, he told them. Don't you understand? How could I describe the people of this generation? Well, you're like children playing games on the playground, yelling at their playmates. You don't like it when we want to play wedding, and you don't like it when we want to play funeral. You will neither dance nor mourn. Why is it that when John came to you, neither feasting nor drinking wine, you said he had the demon in him? So they were talking about John. When he came out of the wilderness, when he was talking about the Messiah, talking about the one who was coming, they were talking about him, calling him all sorts of names. And then Jesus goes on to say, yet when the Son of Man came, talking about himself, and went to feast and drink wine, he said, look at this man. He's nothing but a glutton and a drunkard. He spends all his time with tax collectors and other affluent sinners. But God's wisdom will visibly, will be visibly seen living in those who embrace it. Do you remember uh, last chapter when um, Jesus took hold of Matthew? Was there, actually, it was chapter 9, I believe. Jesus took hold of Matthew and said, hey, follow me. And then the next paragraph says immediately, and then Jesus was uh, at Matthew's house with all the tax collectors and all the outcasts. 
So Jesus loved to hang out with people that didn't necessarily uh, meet the standard of what we would say is upright. No, Jesus was hanging out with the ones he called wherever they went. To the low lives, to the high lives, Jesus was always a part of it. And he's still a part of it today. Then Jesus began to openly denounce in chapter 11 where he had done most of his mighty miracles because the people failed to turn away from sin and return to God. He said how tragic it will be for the city of Chorazin and how horrible for the city of Bethsaida. For if the powerful miracles that I performed in Chorazin and Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have humbled themselves and repented. They'd turn from their sins. Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And Capernaum, do you really think you'll be exalted because of the great miracles I've done there? No, you'll be brought down to the depths of hell because of your rejection of me. For if the miracles I worked in your streets were done in Sodom, it would still be standing today. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for the region of Sodom in the Day of Judgment than it will be for you. Remember that Tyre and Sidon were two Gentile cities on the Mediterranean coast that were known for their wickedness. So he was referring to something that was going on that they were known for. Then Jesus exclaimed in the middle of all this, Father, thank you for you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth. And you've hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Isn't that the way it is today? When we get full of ourselves, we think we're too big for our britches. It's like revelation is sometimes difficult to come. But when we humble ourselves and say, God, I'm, I'm open to your direction. I'm open to what you have to say. I'm open to what you're thinking. I'm open to, you. I'm open to what, what you're saying to me. He's so willing to share his heart with us. Instead, you have shared it with these who humble themselves. Yes, Father, your plan delights your heart as you've chosen this way to extend your kingdom by giving it to those who become like trusted children. Are you like a trusted child? Or are you a full-grown adult and have already entered into the place of fear? Little children, little children are rarely fearful. They will run and jump and play and do flips and do all sorts of things that we would not think of doing today. They're so much more limber. They're so much more flexible than we are in so many different ways. He says, wow, if we had just be like trusted children, just be like trusted children. Father, you've entrusted me with all that you have and all that you are. No one fully and intimately knows the son except the father. And no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. But the Son is able to unveil the Father to anyone who chooses. And this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me. I will refresh your life for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Do you know that in that moment, Jesus was extending an invitation to those listening to come and to enter into the new covenant, to come and enter into what he had for them. He was transitioning them from, hey, you've been under this harsh yoke, but I offer you an easy yoke. I offer you a pleasant experience. I offer you relationship with me. I offer you to live in me. From a, a harsh yoke to a, a, a relationship part. From religion to relationship. From, if you don't do this, I'm going to hurt you, feeling like feeling like to, hey, we're going to work this out together. I live in you, you live in me. And we're going to journey together as we confront these things, as we are moving into more and more revelation of who Father is for you 
Jesus is for us. He's for us. This is before he took the cross, clearly. This is before, and he knew. He knew where he was headed. He knew. He had a strategy. He had an intention. He was being who he was while he was on the way to where he was going. And I love that. Jesus was not religious. Jesus was very relational. Jesus hung out with people. He sat with people. He lived with people. He stayed with different kind of people. He made himself available to the people. And he also made himself available to the Father to spend extended time with him. He was both. He was both. He lived in both realms. He lived with the Father. And he lived with those that the Father was inviting into sonship. He lived and he loved while he was on the way to fulfilling his purpose. I bless you today. This was Matthew 11 out of the Passion Translation. I'm going to have communion now. If you'd like to join me, you're welcome to. We try to do communion after each uh, reading. Sometimes I'll read a whole chapter and sometimes I'll just read a context. Father, I thank you for um, your friendship. I thank you for your lordship. I thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness. And God, there are many of us that have things happening in our world and we um, don't know how to handle it, don't know how to move forward in it, don't know how to step away from it. God, some are literally in situations where they're being deserted by spouses left alone by family members and there's just a lot happening in other in people's worlds and God this is a day God what I just want to ask you to be the word for all of us God remind us of your words to us remind us of your blood covenant remind us of what you did on the cross. Remind us of the power that we carry in this relationship with you. Remind us, God. I celebrate who you are. I celebrate what you did. I celebrate what it means for me, for my family, <laughs> for this planet. I celebrate. You know, while I'm chewing, I'm thinking about the word. I'm thinking about some of the words he's given me in my life. I'm thinking about how sometimes he gives me a, a strong word. And he gives me something I don't understand. And, and he's like, okay, now come with me and let me help you understand. He gave me something some months back that he's still revealing to me. Something that's deep on the inside. And it's for the purpose of freedom. And it's for the purpose of, of helping others as well. But he's revealing to me his love, his mercy, his kindness. And he's revealing to me things that are not loving, that are not kind. And so I was thinking about how we want him to speak to us. But sometimes we just think God's just going to say, I love you and that's the end of it. And you're perfect just like you are. And I don't ever want, I don't ever want to change you because you're amazing. And, and yet, he loves us right where we are. And he, he calls us his sons and daughters. And we are amazing. But yet God, in his beautiful kindness, wants to draw us by his words, by his personal words, and bring change in us. So I want to eat this other piece, this next piece. God, I just eat this with the desire for change. The desire for me to be in agreement with you regarding my life, regarding living, regarding health, regarding healing, regarding intimacy, regarding your purposes and plans. God, I say yes 
to your words. I say yes to your body. I say yes, God, you told them, eat my flesh. God, we eat your words with the intention. We eat your words with the intention. We eat your words with this place of surrender. We say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. And God, I just thank you. Is your desire that we be well, that we be healed, that we be whole, that we be fully restored? God, we stand in that place where you tell us that we came from you and we return to you, and that we are co crucified, co buried, co resurrected, that we're in Christ, that we're from Christ. God, we receive the resurrection, we receive all that it means for us intimately and personally. We receive our health we receive the miraculous we receive provision we receive protection we receive financial recompense we receive all that you are and all that you've called us to become we receive I had a sense this morning that are some having uh, dire financial problems, dire. So God, we, we are trusting you for a miraculous turn in finances. God, we know that you give us instructions. You will encounter us. You will talk with us. You will share with us how to proceed. God, we receive this trust to believe to follow you as you free us into the freedom that is already ours. And this last bit, <laughs> this is for the calling that's on your life. Do you know that there's a calling on your life? It's not just a spiritual calling. It's not, you know, some people, all they want or what they see as calling is something to do with ministry. Yet, God calls us to just to live and to move and to breathe and to have our being in Him. And from that place of in Him, in love, Every day he reveals the calling to be known by him. Every day he reveals this great intimacy with him. Every day with those around us. We, we think a calling is going out and doing something. It's not always. What if your calling that day is to care for that little baby in your arms? Or that woman that you care for? Or that man who's in need of love or that uh, that group of children that you're called to connect with every day what if your calling is that neighbor next to you that's getting beaten to a pulp by their spouse and you're the only smile they ever get what if your calling is to continue that everyday walk that everyday walk around the park where you just happen to see that same person every day and you happen to have a conversation every single day that lengthens your walk, yet you know that something's happening with that person that's causing them to understand that there is a God that loves him. What if your calling is simply to be who you are? Well, on the way to where you're going. And when we stop looking so hard to be used by God, God just simply lives through us. Oh, to be lived in and lived through 
instead of thought to be used like an old pair of shoes. Now that is worth eating his words for. Let's receive the call to be. And now, you know, when he was on the planet, he told him, he said, hey, eat my, eat my flesh, drink my blood, symbolizing where he was headed, what he was going to do. Now, he's already done what he said he was going to go do. We get to trust and believe in what he said and what he did. Trust and believe that it matters, that it brought change on the planet, that it made you into a new creation, that you're a new person, that I'm a new person, that you can live forgiven, that you can live forgiving others. This is so critical to our lives. It is so critical. It's such a... Um, Strong place of darkness to think it's okay to live unforgiven or unforgiving. To be filled with anger toward those around you and justify your anger. This is part of the deception. Justifying our anger, justifying unforgiveness. When at the cross, it's all level. It's so level at the foot of the cross, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter what will be done to you, no matter what's been done to me, no matter what will be done to me. There is a place where there is peace, not anger. There's a place where we no longer pick up the chips that we want to keep on our shoulder because of past behavior or, or even current behavior, and we live identified in Christ, identified by God, and that's our identity. In that place of identity, this, this is a place of freedom. Identity. Identity. I say let's drink to our identity. Take a sip. And this is the thing. It's level at the foot of the cross. It is level at the foot of the cross. No matter... Where you come from, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter what you're even going to do, there's no justification for any of us to hold on to resentment or bitterness or anger. None of us, no matter what color, no matter what ethnicity, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what's been done to us, the blood has forgiven us. Jesus has forgiven all of us. You are forgiven. I am forgiven. We get to live from a place where we forgive and we're forgiven. I say drink a sip. God, I just pray for our cities, our nation, our world. In a season where things are so cattywampus, that we're leaning into emotions that still kill and destroy. God, we say no to destruction. We say yes to reconciliation. I'm taking another sip. Father, we celebrate who you are. We celebrate what you've done. We celebrate... What took place at the cross. God, show us all how to live from a place where it's finished. Show us all how to live from a place where forgiveness for our wrongs and those who wronged us has already taken place. And let us move forward as one human race. God, let us come into the revelation that you are our Father and that we 
are all brothers and sisters. God, let us live as one human race, drinking, eating, living, breathing, same color blood, same air, that you are our Father and we belong to you and one another. God, let us live from a place of remittance and forgiveness. Let us move forward from our spirits alive in Christ. Let us move into the place where we know you've already paid the price. Let us live, my Lord, my God, my King. Let us stop complaining and let's start singing. God, let us live from your spirit and not from our flesh. I bless you, Lord God. We receive what you've done on our behalf. And we forgive and we decree our forgiveness. And I receive my last hit. I bless you, I bless you, I bless you. Father, I pray today you bring so much revelation to your sons and daughters. God, we are listening. We are listening. We say we are listening to you in the midst of feeling deserted, in the midst of feeling sick, in the midst of feeling alone, in the midst of feeling angry, in the midst of feeling resentment, in the midst of feeling bitterness, in the midst of feeling just screwed up or screwed over. God, you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. And God, we say no more. And we say no more. We just say an end, an end, an end to what's been hiding to kill us from within. We say no to what has had a plan. We say no to the work of the flesh, the work of man. We say yes to our spirits alive in Christ. We say yes to the love of God for all of our lives. In Jesus' name. I bless you today. I read daily from the Passion Translation. And tomorrow will be Matthew 12. Hope to see you here. Talk soon. This is Donna Rogers. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.